Well, good morning. Welcome to those who are joining us online and in the fellowship hall as well today. As we continue on through the Gospel of Mark today, we're looking closely at Jesus' interactions with two very different people in Mark 5 today, if you'd like to follow along in your Bible. And these stories reveal some really important things about the power of God's love for us. Love changes things in us and around us in ways that we'd never expect. Now, some of you might know that I grew up in northern Minnesota, and out of necessity, I learned to cope with certain things that you just have to face, wood ticks, mosquitoes, poison ivy, but there is one thing that I've never been able to tolerate, leeches. And maybe it came from watching Stand By Me as a kid, (laughs) but for me, after swimming in a lake, if I found a leech attached to me, I would just go out of my mind. Get it off, get it off, get it off! But when I was in college, I worked at a Bible camp in the summers, and I was in charge of a cabin of 8 to 11 girls each week who I'd get to know and teach about Jesus. And eventually, the day came when one of my girls was out swimming, and she got a leech, and she came to me screaming, get it off, get it off, get it off! And in that moment, something changed in me. Because while my mind was still screaming, leech, run away, something stronger than my fear held me there. It made me choose to face down that leech, and you know what that something was. It was love. Love for a child. How I felt about the situation suddenly didn't matter anymore because the scared little girl in front of me was depending on me to make it right. So for the first time in my life, I was the one with the waterfront kit, very calmly saying, watch this, this is actually kind of cool. You rub a little salt on its back, and in a minute you're going to see it curl up and drop off. See? Gone. In a few minutes, the leech was off, and she was gone, off to her next activity, and I sat there shuddering, did I really just touch a leech? (laughs) How did I do that? What a strange power children have. We'll do things for them that we would never do otherwise. And it made me think about God's powerful love for us, a love so powerful it led to Jesus dying in our place, dying for us so he could open up a place for us to live, to live forever with him in a life that can never be taken away from us. For God so loved the world, so loved us. That love changes things. In Mark 5 today, we see Jesus' love in action in response to two different people. The first story is one of a young 12-year-old girl who is the apple of her daddy's eye. Her father is an influential man, a leader of the synagogue, respected in the community, but all her father's power and influence couldn't stop this disease from attacking her. Jairus was fighting a losing battle, and he was desperate. He knew that he'd come to the end of what he could do. He needed a greater power than himself. So this dignified, respected synagogue leader fought his way through the crowd, threw himself down in the dirt, and begged Jesus for help. For the love of his child, he was willing to give up everything, even his pride. And without a word, Jesus immediately drops everything and goes with him. Please don't miss this, because that's your Savior's heart. That is how our God loves. And believe it or not, it's always been how our God loves because he isn't like us, praise God. And this is what I mean when I say he isn't like us. We human beings who have lived in this broken world might expect a different kind of response first. Maybe something more like, well, what do we have here? Mighty, powerful Jairus, it seems like before you might have been in league with those Pharisees who wanted me dead, but now when you got nowhere to go, here you are on your knees begging me for help. Maybe the disciples were thinking that. Maybe Jairus himself was thinking that, but Jesus wasn't. Jesus' reaction to Jairus' heartbroken, desperate cry was just to immediately, without comment, go with him. You have to know that about the heart of our God because if you miss it, you miss what's so amazing about his grace. As a pastor, over the years, I've talked with many people who found themselves at the end of their rope. It's become clear to them they actually do need God. 
because only the one who's been through death himself and made it away into life, only the one who chose to face the horrible situation of the cross for our sake, can we trust to help us find hope and life out of the horrible situations where we find ourselves? But so many times when people finally realize this and they want to throw themselves at his feet, they feel like they can't because they think that God will hold a grudge against them or that their past unwillingness has now disqualified them from his mercy. I know I need God, but it's too late. I can't come to him now. I'd be a hypocrite to turn to him when I need his help. After everything I've said and done, I obviously don't deserve it. How can I ask? Why would he even listen? Have you ever heard that from someone? Have you ever been that someone? If so, this is the moment for you to experience the miracle, the absolute joy of who Jesus is. Jesus came to reveal the truth about the heart of God the Father, a truth that even King David knew a thousand years before this when he wrote in Psalm 51, 17, A broken and contrite heart, you, O God, will not despise. This past October, I taught an Old Testament overview to some gap year students at Mount Carmel. And in that five days of flying through all the stories of God's relationship with this sinful, broken, and beloved people all through the Old Testament, one thing powerfully stood out to me that shocked and amazed me, that over and over again, no matter what kind of horrible things people had done, when they realized they needed him and turned back to God, when they humbled themselves before him, God was so amazingly quick to respond with mercy over and over and over again. Do you remember the story of Jonah and the big fish? Do you remember the reason why Jonah didn't want to go and tell Nineveh to repent? It was because he was afraid they would repent. And then God would have mercy on them, and he didn't want God to have mercy on them because he didn't like them. Jonah ran because he knew even then a broken and contrite heart his God would not despise, even if those contrite hearts belong to his enemies. Our God is a God of justice, but when we come to him humbly seeking mercy, he is quick to meet us there. For God so loved. And I recently read a set of definitions in a devotional that apply to this. They've stuck with me all week, these definitions. They are these. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is being given more than you could ever deserve. Jesus came into this world so he could meet the broken, contrite heart with the gifts of God's mercy and his grace. You see, realizing that you need him when you didn't think you did before, that doesn't make you a hypocrite. It just means you're human. Because the truth is, all of us come to him when we realize we need him. And for some of us, that's earlier than others. But always, that's the moment where he meets us. It's only when you know you need a savior that you can truly know that you have one. So when in his desperation, Jairus humbles himself and begs Jesus for help, Jesus responds immediately because a broken and contrite heart our God will not despise. Are there things you've been holding back from Jesus? Things you're afraid to bring to him? What's holding you back? Do you see Jesus today for who he is? Well, then on the way, we run into another story, or actually another story runs into us, and it teaches us something even more about the way our Lord loves. As they're making their way through the crowds, hurrying to Jairus' home, Jesus suddenly stops and calls out into the crowd that's pressing in around him, who touched me? And everyone thought that was an odd question, because in a crowd like this, it might be easier to ask who didn't touch me. But the one Jesus is asking about knows who she is. Because unnoticed in the crowd, hidden in plain sight, a woman had, in faith, reached out to touch the edge of his cloak, and Jesus had felt the power move out from him, and someone had been healed. 
And there was further healing that Jesus needed to give her. Now this story shows up both in Mark and Luke, and this is the kind of story that historians look at when confirming the authenticity of historical texts. Because the truth is, even today, people don't like to talk about women's issues like this in mixed company. How much less do you think a bunch of men seeking to record Jesus' miracles of power 2,000 years ago would want to document how Jesus' power was released, seemingly without his knowledge, by some unknown woman to address ritually unclean women's issues? I'm sure they didn't want to talk about that. But they had to, because Jesus didn't let this healing go unnoticed. And it's hard for us to even understand the kind of suffering this woman had been through. Her condition would have made her ritually unclean, which meant she couldn't touch other people and they couldn't touch anything that she's touched. So her life of isolation would have been a lot like a person with leprosy. Scripture said she spent all her money on doctors trying to cure her. I don't even want to imagine what kind of horrors the doctoring of 2,000 years ago would have looked like. But after having dealt with this for 12 years... Incidentally, the same number of years that Jairus' daughter had been alive. She's got nothing left. No money, no status, no one to advocate for her. But she hears about Jesus, this healer from God, and she believes. And she tells herself, if I can only get close enough to touch the hem of his robe, I'll be healed. Notice, she doesn't ask Jesus to heal her. Because what if touching her made him ritually unclean? That thought horrified her. No, just touching the hem of his robe, that should be enough. But if she was going to get that close to him, she'd have to be in a crowd of people who were all touching her. People who, if they found out, would be furious that she had made all of them unclean. But for them, that would just mean a few days of ritual, they'd be back to normal life. So she decided to risk the anger of the crowd for the chance to receive the restored life she was so desperate for. So in desperate faith, risking everything, she reached out for the hem of his robe and she was healed. And having lived her life hiding for over a decade... I can imagine what she wanted most in this moment was just to slip away unnoticed. But if she had been allowed to do that, would she always feel like she'd stolen this healing from Jesus? That she hadn't really been worth his time or his attention? No, Jesus knew physical healing was not enough. She needed to be called out. She needed to confess that she had been an unclean person who dared present herself in this crowd, that she was the one who had received his healing power because even more than being healed, Jesus knew she needed to know she had been seen, that her healing mattered, that her suffering had mattered, that she mattered. So he wouldn't take another step until she came out of hiding. So trembling, most likely expecting to be scolded or punished, she fell before him and confessed. And Jesus' response to that confession was to proclaim publicly in front of everyone, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Or as the First Nations translation of the Bible states it, daughter, Your trust in me has made you well. See, Jesus was more than worthy of her trust. And he wanted it to be well with her. Not just with her body, but also with her soul. Do you see what's happening here in this story? Jairus had come to Jesus as a passionate father, throwing himself down to plead for the life of his daughter. And his self-sacrificial love for his child is beautiful and powerful. But this woman had no one to plead for her, or so she thought. But in this moment, Jesus was showing her, yes, you do. You have a loving heavenly father who sees you, who knows you. And just like Jairus' daughter, you also have one who would give his everything for your sake. Jesus looks at her and he calls her my daughter. The one who had no status, no advocate, 
is publicly claimed by the Son of God. Now her faith had probably struggled a lot in those 12 long years, but God had seen her, he had heard her, and he had loved her through it all. And Jesus couldn't let her go without knowing that. Because there are kinds of healing even more important than that of the body. But in the middle of that beautiful moment comes the report that Jairus' daughter had just died. It's too late. Jesus is too late. Had the time Jesus spent giving this woman her life back cost Jairus the chance of seeing his daughter saved? On this earth, we human beings only have so much time. We can only do so much. And in choosing to do one thing, we can't do another. There are limits to being human. But Jesus came to give us the kind of hope that's bigger than this life, that's bigger than the limits of this life, a hope that's even bigger than death. So Jesus tells Jairus not to be afraid, but simply believe. And when they get to Jairus' house, Jesus tells the people to stop mourning. She's only sleeping, and they laugh at him. But then in that quiet house, Jesus reaches out, and he takes the child's hand, and he called to her, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. And she rose back to life, back to her parents, restored. Now, I can imagine that hearing that story might bring pain to some of you today because that was not your situation. You didn't have that kind of miracle that handed back to you your son or daughter, your husband or wife, your sister or brother, mother or father. You prayed for a miracle like this and it didn't come. And you know what it's like to hear that report, don't bother the teacher anymore, it's over. But this is where this story stops just being a story about the past, about what Jesus did for these people, and becomes a story about what he came to do for all of us. Because this same Jesus came to offer the miraculous power of resurrection life to all of us, to speak into our death these same words, beloved one, arise. To open that power, not just to the one person at a time, he could be physically present to restore back to earthly life, but to make the way for all of us to share in the life of our Heavenly Father now and forever. A grace opened up for all who will humbly receive it, that we all may be made well, eternally, through simple trust in him. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the day the season of Lent begins, reminding us of Jesus' journey to the cross for our sake. And we mark our foreheads with ashes, remembering that justice is getting what we deserve. And our guilt is clear. And the wages of sin is death. But mercy is not getting what we deserve. And through Jesus choosing to intervene in our story for us, to put his own life between us and that death sentence, we begin to remember that in Christ, grace is getting more than we could ever deserve from our God. Ash Wednesday this year falls on Valentine's Day. And what greater reminder could there be of why Jesus chose to take this journey to face down death itself for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Scripture tells us that on the cross, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to set him free, and yet he didn't. Through the pain and the terror of the cross, something more powerful held him there. And you know what it was. It was love. Every parent or loved one of one who's suffering, who has ever prayed, Lord, can't I take this pain for them? Is simply echoing the heart of our God because that's what Jesus did. The ultimate pain of separation from God that our sin creates, the pain of hell, he took on himself for us so that through him we will never have to be separated from the Father. 
Romans 8 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, one day you and I will hear the voice of the only one who can save us. The voice our hearts long to hear will speak to you and me. Talitha kum, beloved one, arise. Because there is one who gave his all for you so he could reach into your death and mine to lift us to life, to give us back to our loving Father, both here and now forever, to restore us to the one who loves us no matter what separated us in the past. And he offers this freely to all who will come. That's what it means to have a savior. And many of you know the power of that kind of love. In fact, for many people, there comes a point when a parent realizes, I can provide clothes, food, and education for my child, but for the stuff that will help them get through crisis, to see hope through life and even through death, for that they need something more. And for that, I have to follow Jairus to Jesus, to the one greater than me. When a parent brings a child to be baptized, to Sunday school, to confirmation, when they come to learn themselves more of who God is so they can teach their child, they do that because they love their kids, because they want them to receive the kind of love and forgiveness and grace they know everyone needs to be whole, to be well. They come praying as Jairus did, Lord Jesus, lay your hand on my daughter, on my son. And it seems we can so readily trust that God loves and forgives children because we do, even when they frustrate us. Yet, do you have a hard time believing that God's love and forgiveness, his grace is also for you? That even when you'd rather hide from God living in guilt or shame or fear or desperation, that he still sees you? Jesus shows us in his tender reaction to this woman in the crowd that this is the way he feels about you. You are his child. And when we come to him in trust, every time we reach for him, whether we feel it or not, he will be there. God's heart is one of parent love, sometimes correcting, sometimes delighting, but always for the sake of his child's good. But just as children don't always receive what they ask for from their parents, the truth is our prayers are not always answered the way we would like them to be in this broken world. Sometimes we won't see the answer on this side of heaven. But because Jesus chose to walk into our sin and death to bring us life, we can trust his promise that those who come to him, he will never turn away. Jesus came for you who are struggling with loss and sadness so you may know he is the resurrection and the life and that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Jesus is your advocate. He stands in the gap for you. You are his and he is yours forever. Whoever comes to him will never be turned away because a broken and contrite heart our God will not despise. So come to him today, don't wait, because he came for you, for the love of his child. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, today, like this woman in the crowd, we come to you reaching, knowing our need for you, for your healing, for your love, for assurance of our adoption into your eternal family. And like Jairus, we come pleading to you for our loved ones, for our situations, for the things in life where we can see no answers. So today, Lord, we pray that you would call us out of hiding, that you would lay your hand on us. Bring to life what's fallen dead in us. Resurrect our faith, our hope, our trust in you that we might be well, that it might be well with our souls. Lord, we confess that we need you to be Lord of our lives. And as we remember who you are today, your love for us, bring us the joy of knowing that you are our home now and forever. And help us to live in your peace and to share the joy of who you are with those around us who need the comfort that only you can bring. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.